Welcome to Google Labs at the New York City Accessibility Meetup. Thank you for coming tonight. We're very excited to have our second meetup and um, very happy to have all of you here. So, uh, Google Labs, I just want to give a shout out um, for hosting us tonight. I work at Google Labs for uh, Ruby and Agile Development Consultancy doing mostly web development and uh, mobile app development. So if you have any uh, needs uh, in web development or even web development with accessibility, we do that. So come talk. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce to you Mirabai Knight, who works on uh, Plover, which is an open source accessible, open source stenography tool. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself a bit. Hi, uh, my name is Mirabai Knight, and uh, I'm a stalker. I won't keep doing that because we have stand to capture me. But um, I just want to talk a little bit about Plumber, my open source project, and the accessibility implications of it. And then I'm going to hand it over to Plumber's lead developer, Husky Fisher, and he'll talk a little bit about developing uh, open source projects that have accessibility implications and managing the community and stuff along those lines. So how many people here have actually seen a, a live captioner in action, not on television, but in, in the room? That's awesome. That's definitely what I like to see in a room full of accessibility people. That's like probably 90% of the room. Glad to hear it, because we're a fairly obscure profession even now. Uh, steno machines have been around since around 1912, but we were only hooked up to computers as of the late 1980s. So as a profession, uh, live capturing is very young, and most people, if they have heard of it, only think of it for television and not for live applications. But myself, I work in universities primarily for deaf and hard of hearing college students. I also work with um, professionals for business meetings and conferences. And it was around six years ago that I graduated from stand-up school. I got started as sort of an apprentice captioner. And I was very frustrated with my proprietary stand-up software, which cost $4,000, had really obnoxious DRM that required me to jump through all sorts of hoops even to use the software and, and really limited my ability to use it the way I wanted to. And it didn't have a number of key features that I really needed for my captioning work because all commercial stenography software is for court reporters, which I've never, I've never done any work. Um, so my brother had sort of infected me with the open source bug when I was around 10 years old. He's, he's a big open source evangelist. And my frustration with the software combined with that sort of thought in the back of my head that, that getting involved in open source was a good thing to do made me think that this might be the way to go. So originally I thought that I would actually have to learn to program and develop it myself because I didn't think anyone could possibly want to do it for me. But by a ridiculous stroke of luck, I applied, um, I, I put a posting in the elevator of my co-working space asking for a Python tutor. And the guy who answered it started off to read me in Python. It turns out he had a PhD from the MIT Media Labs and was both a hardware and a software guy. And after a few weeks, it was clear that I did not have a gift for programming and starting from scratch, it would be forever before I was able to develop the software that I actually wanted. But he got so excited about it, he decided he was just going to take off the develop, uh, take over the development from me <laughs> and, and do it on his own. I, I paid him as much as I could, but he worked at a steep discount. And um, so he developed Clover for about a year. Then he got another job and had to give it up when Hesky, my savior, contacted me out of the blue because his girlfriend was in STEM school, actually the same STEM school that I graduated from, and he wanted to do his part to make STEM machine accessible. So he's been developing it ever since. He's amazing, and he'll, he'll tell you all about that story later. But basically, I can go over the nuts and bolts of Steno if you want, maybe in the questions, if you're curious about the details, but 
because I don't have that much time, I think I want to focus more on the potential of Steno in various accessibility areas. So first off, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, captioning. This guy right here, Stan Sakai, my captioner, uh, actually started out on Plutter. He, he uh, originally just wanted to use Steno to take notes when he was in college, but he wound up getting so excited about it, he taught himself you know, and practice 10 hours a night for about a year, and finally realized that he had gotten up to about 230 words per minute, which is the speed you really need to be an entry level captioner. And uh, I think dropped out of college and launched his career as a captioner, and I think he's pretty happy about it. So <laughs> he didn't do that with Clover the whole way, he actually switched to proprietary software because Clover wasn't in the proper shape at that point. But, but I still count him as one of our success stories. So captioning for deaf and hard of hearing people is incredibly important. Uh, it's, it's very useful for all sorts of people, but primarily people with hearing loss who don't know sign language or might not even acknowledge their hearing loss, which is the, the vast majority of people who have hearing loss that interferes with their life moderately to significantly in some situations, but not at all in others. These are people often they've, they've begun to lose their hearing in middle age, and that carries through to, um, you know, into their 60s and 70s. They don't acknowledge their hearing loss, but they don't necessarily recognize it, and they have no idea what they can do to compensate for it. Hearing aids can only do so much. Many of them are not um, candidates for cochlear implants, and they often don't know that caption exists. But along the way, as this accommodation has sort of picked up speed, more and more captioning is offered as a matter of course, not necessarily specifically requested by deaf advocates who know their rights and are able to ask for it, but are, it's just become an included accommodation. And so this sort of invisible pool of people who don't know that they have rights under the American with Disabilities Act, who may be fine one-on-one -on -one in a small room, but who are totally at sea in a large auditorium where they can't read anyone's lips, they're finally beginning to realize that there's an accommodation that works for them. Um, also, there are people who use sign interpreters in some situations who prefer captioning in other situations. You know, they might want to have sign interpretation for conversational or mobile or very interactive sessions, but for things like lectures when there's very specific terminology that might not have specific analogs in sign, captioning might be better. Um, captioning is also really useful for people with attention deficit disorder. It's useful for some people with dyslexia, which might seem counterintuitive, but having the bimodal input of getting something both from your ears and into your eyes at the same time can often help people to comprehend information and process information more thoroughly, even if they have a reading disability. Uh, it's also extremely useful for people who are not necessarily fluent in English or who can read it better than they can understand it orally, which is true of a lot of uh, people who are just learning English. So captioning as universal design, I think, is really important. Um, probably don't have to make the case too hard for you guys, but I just thought I'd lay out all of the ways that captioning benefits a lot of people, including that often neglected pool of people who don't self-identify as having disability and don't know their rights with the ADA, which is a very large group of people who have been almost totally neglected um, by traditional accessibility solutions. So that's one option. The one, one, one sort of way that stenography is useful in accessibility. Another way is for people with speech disabilities who want to communicate, who might use um, augmentative communication devices, but if any of you guys have seen those in action, you'll know that even the best of them are very slow and to a certain degree somewhat stilted. You know, if people are just using QWERTY to type, they can do maybe 100, 120 words a minute. If people are using uh, systems such as MinSpeak, they can sort of cluster ideas and, and get the sentences out somewhat faster. But even so, they're nowhere near a conversation level of speech. But with Steno, um, you can basically write <laughs> as fast as you can talk. And um, if you just <laughs> hook this into a text-to-speech engine oh, and you uh, make it portable, which is still something I'm working on, you can make an AAC device 
that allows people to speak at a conversational speed, which is unprecedented and somewhat revolutionary. So I think that's a really important thing that we can look forward to in the future. There aren't yet any really good mobile or portable steno input devices, but I think there's a lot of potential for that. Uh, I'm also working on an application that hooks Plumber into glass. I, I've got a pair of glass and uh, I've got some developing app for it. So I think that having that sort of feedback will also be useful. Um, so it certainly make it more mobile and portable. The third area, and I think this one might be particularly of interest to you guys, is addressing the terrible underemployment of blind and low vision people. I mean, in this country and around the world, there are incredibly well educated, brilliant, fantastic minds out there that are going to waste because no one will employ them. And one thing specifically that makes stenography a really good fit for people with vision loss is that text processing speed, or rather speech processing speed, I think is the fundamental bottleneck of Steno. If you look at Stan, or if you look at me when I'm writing, our fingers are not moving particularly quickly. Uh, people might think that it's a matter of dexterity, but it's really all what happens in the brain. To be able to comprehend English speech very quickly, and to encode it into Steno, and then send the, finger, the, the, the code to your fingers, of those three steps, by far the hardest, is comprehending English without slowing down and seizing up when people are speaking to you at 240, 260, 280 words a minute. Those speeds are very fast for your typical English speaker. They're quite slow for your typical screen reader user. You know, I know people who use screen readers who listen to them at 500, 600 words per minute. So for people who've already done the work training their brains to process speech at that level, I, I don't have any scientific evidence for this, but I think it's a, there's a very good chance that they've already done a lot of the really hard work. And if they want to try to learn stenography, I think they will have considerable leg up uh, over most people who honestly find themselves very hard pressed to achieve the speeds of 230 words per minute that are required to, to be captioners for reporters and uh, card providers like me. There's an 85% dropout rate in Steno schools nationwide, which is pretty disgraceful. But I think a lot of that is because people do not have the sufficient speech processing speed going into it, and they're not able to develop it while they're in school. <laughs> so those are my three ideas for how stenography can impact uh, accessibility. And now with Plutter, which is free and works with hardware that's $45 as opposed to this little number, which is about $4,000, I feel like we might be poised on the edge of a sort of steno renaissance, and I'm really hoping to get that going. So I'm going to turn it over to Hesky, and he'll tell you all about how this goes. Sorry. We're in the static. Then you suddenly have to become an expert into it. 
uh, beyond what it normally would be developed or cut out the note to somehow dig into its guts and make it give you its text or, or change its colors or, or anything like that. And that's what it's been like uh, developing Flutter. From the very beginning, writing the normal code to do the logic that Flutter needs to do was very easy. But then suddenly, I had to convince the operating system to do things that it desperately did not want to do. Um, as you can see, uh, it involves things like being on top of our applications, going, you know, coming up, going down. Um, and then, of course, the community wanted it for every operating system on out there. Um, so then began the journey of suddenly trying to become that type of expert on every operating system that I could get my hands on. Um, and similar things like that. For example, Josh was the original programmer on Flutter that I mentioned. He is quite amazing. And he is working on building an open source Flutter machine. Uh, the machine that everybody uses here is $4,000, and that's not unusual. And uh, Josh is trying to target a much, much lower price point. That was an example that's been coming in. And I'm helping out. So. Three hundred just to work okay. So that's where does it matter? Yeah, that's very good. So I started from scratch again. I have the intention. I'd like to make a machine that's a stock machine, but I don't know any of the uh, the required techniques that I need. So once again, um, <laughs> you know, one minor example is usually the machine speaks via USB. I have never done any USB. I had always thought it would be a great idea to learn USB, but like many people, I had an idea that I wanted to learn hardware engineering, but I never had a project I wanted to do. Well, the problem is once you get to the project you want to do, then you want to, you have an intention now, but you haven't built that skill. And uh, it's kind of a uh, catch 22. Uh, so if I can encourage anybody to just sort of start with projects earlier. <laughs> and build up the skills that will become necessary as soon as you know what you actually want to do. Um, so the other, the other aspect of uh, working on Flutter yeah, that's interesting and uh, similar to usability is um, for many people who do accessibility programming, I am not the user. Um, so it's very hard to... I'm not a stenographer it's, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to guess what a stenographer actually wants, especially when I'm making up a feature. Even when I'm asked explicitly for a feature, um, I'm interpreting it you know, based on my understanding of it. And I think that's probably has a lot in common with you doing something for a user that's hearing disabled or vision disabled. Uh, you can only put yourself in their shoes so well. Uh, and so uh, the most valuable tool that Clover has is its community to constantly throw things out there and encourage feedback. Um, there's no way I could have made any progress without the Clover community uh, constantly getting feedback. Some of it not so polite, <laughs> uh, but, but still very worthwhile. Uh, and I think that has a lot of parallels uh, here too. So speaking of the community, um, I did not realize that I would become a babysitter, um, taking on this programming role. As soon as I had an official position where I was the main programmer, suddenly uh, it kind of became my responsibility to make sure the community didn't self-destruct at random times. Uh, every mailing list that is able to be joined openly will attract different types of destructive elements. Uh, people who post about their pet peeve on something unrelated. Um, but less destructive are people who are passionate about the project but want it to go in their direction. And, and it's really hard to deal with that kind of thing um, because it goes on two directions. <laughs> uh, I want to take their feedback and it's extremely valuable in most of the cases, but then very often it immediately starts to conflict with, say, my vision of where the project should go. Uh, but then I have to ask myself fairly, is my vision the right one, right? These are expensive for the users. And in Plover's case, there's actually an interesting split between users. There's the people, there are the people that I think of as stenographers, people who are going to stenography school or 
try some other school and now they their own or not on the books, but sort of classic stenography, and they agree to be bound by the restrictions and rules that all stenographers work by. And then there's the blue sky business. The people who show up to stenography and say, that's great, now how do we make it a hundred times better? Uh, let's add 30 more buttons and let's map the keyboard to everything. And, <laughs> you know, and again, I, I have to try to balance this notion with, well, that's not what this app is for, but the idea is maybe, maybe that's what it is, because these make up a certain number of users, and maybe I'm the crazy one, right? They've got a million dollar idea, and I'm just saying, that's stupid, let's not do it. And so it's a constant uh, balance, a balancing act to try to figure out which way is the right way to go. Uh, if I had a simple answer, this would be short. This talk would be shorter. Um, <laughs> but I'd say uh, I do just have to weigh these. And it's not clear that I'm always making the right decision, but what I try very hard to do is to not uh, make them irreversible in the sense that I just shoot it down. I usually just say, that sounds great. I don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if you would like to contribute to that, that would be fantastic. And that's the nice thing about open source project is it does attract people who are passionate and capable of contributing. And so we do get contributions, uh, people write code for us, and then some of our best features uh, come out of there. And uh, when that started happening, I felt like we had truly achieved a, a vibrant and self-supporting uh, community. And I think that should be a goal for, for every open source program. If I'm the only programmer, it's a strong single source of failure for our entire project. <coughs> so those are all the points I wanted to touch. I think it's time for Q&A. You can ask me or Mary or both. So if somebody wants to 
can get over or contribute to, or what is the website? Um, the website is waterstenic.org. Right. We uh, actually suffer from too many websites. We do. Well, well Steta is about here. Uh, Steta, right here. Uh, amazing usability expert, uh, user experience designer, and web designers actually helping us consolidate our websites into one general hub so that people can just put one page and find what they're looking for there instead of the terrible sort of fractured scroll that we have right now. Thank you, Steta. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go for it. 
Um, we're about to probably have more to add to this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, we've done at least one demo session at the local school. Um, so we can see it. But well, they're still adding features like some of the other software that come with. Um, I don't know how it's going to go in the future, but the relationship between Flutter and the software companies and hardware companies is between being ignored and being Some hardware donations, right? That's true. That's true. So what has happened is that, like every world, there are underdogs, and the underdogs have been far friendlier uh, <laughs> than the intervention players. True. Uh, but, right. And I should acknowledge that some companies have been friendly. Um, but uh, you know, the the hardware, for example, will come with uh, protocols that have to be uh, decoded in order to work them. And several companies have been very uh, aggressive. Is actually the only 
new software that's specifically designed for live captioning. It doesn't work with broadcast captioning. It doesn't work with court recording, unlike every other proprietary software out there, which is specifically directed for court reporters. So, you know, as a live captioner myself, I definitely want to sort of shepherd the potential captioning prodigies from trying to settle out as an amateur and learning through Plugger to get up there and then sort of giving them that final push of, of caption training, including ethics, including, you know, deaf culture, including all, all the sorts of things that professional captioners need to know that you can't get just as an amateur playing around with the software. So I'm, I'm very, I feel very passionately about that and I feel like it's really vital to preserving my own career to help bring up the next generation of captioners via Plugger. Thank you so much, Esme and everybody. Um, please round of applause for the speaker. Coming up, we're going to have uh, John Schimmel and DIY Ability Crew talking about um, doing your own DIY hardware accessibility. So uh, let's take five minutes. Uh, introduce yourselves, please, and uh, chat amongst yourselves, and then we'll come back uh, at 8 o'clock and pick up with John Schimmel. Thanks. This is actually the first time I'm using the Plumber software for a live event. So that's why there's like like small mistakes here. Because <laughs> I norm I normally use my proprietary software, that's why. But because it's a presentation about Plumber, I'm like I have to use Plumber no matter what. Thank <laughs> you. 